Hi, welcome back everybody. I'm so sorry that my Monday video is so late, but I had a phone conversation with a friend on Monday after I returned from having yellow dog spayed and we were still talking and the clouds came over and as I put the phone down, a massive storm which resulted in a flash flood broke out. We are lucky we're on the top of an incline in one of the main roads so we didn't have a lot of damage, a bit of damage to the screen door in the kitchen and some water flowing into the kitchen but nothing major. We could mop it up and it was nothing serious. However, Holmes, one road down from me, actually had severe damage. There was also a tree that came down on a power line and we have been without power on and off since yesterday afternoon. Anyway, I don't want to waste any more of your time on other stories, but instead I'm going to get right down to business. As always, the media, Fox, CNN, GB News, magazines, newspapers and social media, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and others are overflowing with their opinions and take on Harry and Meghan's docu-series. And to my regret, in a way, I fell into the same trap, dedicating two videos and hours of my time watching the first three episodes, taking notes and making and putting out videos about it. And why do I feel it was a waste of time? Well, because it feels as if I am fighting a lost cause. Although I'm not British, I love tradition and culture and because the traditions and culture of people from European descent living in Africa has by now pretty much been suppressed and left by the wayside. So we do tend to cling to those of our closest relatives, in my case the British and Scottish people. It is because of this and the fact that my paternal lineage can still be traced to our Scottish ancestors that I have been a lifelong supporter of the monarchy and the Queen. As an older person, it touched me deeply when the Queen passed as she had been part of my life since my earliest memories. Memories like my grandmother and her British Women's Weekly which she bought because she preferred the knitting and crochet patterns to that of our local magazines. As a child, I was privy to conversations about the royal family and the members of the royal family. And as I can recall, no one in my family had ever been particularly fond of the king. But quite frankly, I never gave a hoot and only started paying attention again when his and Diana's engagement was announced, a story I had told many, many times on this channel. As the years went along, and even after Diana's death, I kept up with the latest on the royal family because, to a large extent, of the Queen and Diana's sons. Now, I know I'm not the only one saying this. Many other people of my generation and younger are saying the same thing. Yes, there is Anne and Edward and Sophie, but thank God for William and Catherine, who currently represent the glamour and natural element of the royal family. But glamour and jewels and golden coaches and castles are not all the monarchy is about. They also have tremendous power as an entity and as elite citizens and being tremendously wealthy. I read commentary and once again actually heard the words spoken in Harry and Meghan's reality show that the monarchy and the royal family are indeed dependent on mass popularity. And whether we like it or not, that is true, largely because the British monarchy is a constitutional monarchy and not 
an absolute one. Thus, whatever power the king may have, the power of the people remains greater. If the monarchy loses popularity and a referendum is called for tomorrow, they can be voted out and the monarchy abolished. That is a fact. Countries forming part of the British realm can do the same. Australia, Canada, New Zealand can call a referendum tomorrow and vote not to have the British monarch as their head of state. Members of the Commonwealth are being members voluntarily and can leave if they wish. So yes, it is indeed one big popularity contest. And I think intellectually the king knows this. But his psyche does not believe or accept that. I think his ego is inflated by the fact that the monarchy has survived for so long prior to his own reign. We are all very aware of the Harry and Meghan scenario, the Oprah interview, their podcast, and now the Netflix series. And although we would all like to believe that a Z-list actress and her spineless husband can't possibly damage the monarchy, they can, and they have, and they still are. And that much is now clear. I have said this before, and I'm going to repeat it. We are judging according to our own knowledge of history and the royal family. But the majority of people in both the crown countries and the commonwealth are really not that interested. And their knowledge is based on what they see, hear and read in entertainment shows and cheap gossip magazines. And this includes Harry and Meghan's so-called truth. Those parts of the populace have nothing to base their opinion on other than what is provided for them by these shows and magazines and thus have no reason not to look at Harry and Meghan and go, oh shame, poor victims. No, they equate Harry and Meghan's struggles with their families, with their own struggles in their own families. So indeed, whether Harry and Meghan are lying through their teeth or fabricating a bunch of fantastical stories does not matter. The people who do not have the background, the education, or then the interest in the royal family will believe and support Harry and Meghan because they have no reason not to. And therefore, Harry and Meghan and their narrative is doing damage to the royal family, the monarchy, Britain, the British crown countries, and the Commonwealth. The issues and matters of slavery and racism which Meghan and Harry are bringing into their narrative are their attempt to stay relevant and gain the following and support of a certain group of the population, but also at the cost of those very same people and everyone else. But they do not care. They are both hateful, angry, greedy narcissists who are incapable of thinking further than their noses are long. They are keeping the slavery and racist narrative going, not to help, say, black New Yorkers or the Maoris or Zulus in South Africa or Nigerians, but for their own selfish benefit because each time they open their mouths in public they get paid. Then on the other side of the pond we have the real victims and no not the British royal family but the British 
people who are now being classified by Meghan and Harry as responsible for slavery and racism. And then we have a new king, a man who had been king in waiting all his life, a man who had already signed his old life away and promised to serve and protect, and a man who will reiterate that oath in a few months during his coronation, a man who will again promise to put his country first, a man who has been paid 25% of the total income of the Crown Estate and gets a further multi-million pound income from the Duchy of Lancaster to serve and protect. So no, it is not a selfless job. It is a paid job. Yet only this week he opposed the proposed new bill which will give him the power to strip all royal titles Harry and Meghan hold. The titles which are giving them the very platform to spread this traitorous narrative against the crown and country. And one can only ask, Why? Why the king, the leader of his nation and church, would actually do that and oppose the bull? Well, I thought about it long and hard and weighed one option or possible answer against another. And the most plausible one I can come up with is he knows Harry and Meghan will fight back. And he knows they will continue the narrative and pull the race card. But he also knows full well that whatever he is guilty of is not racism. He knows his own personal history will prove that he is not racist. And deep down, Harry and Meghan likely know that as well. So what is he angry about? Or what is the king afraid of? I actually already gave the answer a few times. Charles is no angel and has far too many skeletons in his own closet. And I predicted that once he is king, it will be used against him. And here it is now. When we talk about Harry and Meghan's shady deals, they can fight back with Charles's many, many shady deals. Remember the cash for honours scandal? Remember all his other cash for favours deals? Going by the sheer number of off kelter deals Prince Charles had been involved in, He makes his brother Andrew look like a toddler in a ball pit. Talk about slagging off their families. And Charles can say, been there, done that. Talk about Harry's book. And we can talk about Dimbleby's book. Talk about media contracts. And we can talk about Charles' Amazon deal. Talking about washing your dirty laundry in public. And we can talk about the interview in which Charles admitted to his affair with Camilla. Talk about Harry's bad behavior and petulant attitude being covered up by the palace. And we can fill books. As a matter of fact, books had been filled with incidents of Charles's bad and petulant behavior. Mostly covered up by the palace. We heard of the then Prince Charles kicking furniture and screaming and ranting for minutes on end, non-stop. Talk about Meghan and Harry's treatment of staff, Meghan calling them late at night and early in the morning. And it could be said that she took a leaf out of Charles's book. Charles had been known to do that and still does talk about competing with other royal households and courtiers 
will tell you horror stories about the competition and mistrust between Charles's household and that of the Queen. Now, I can, because I do have all the material handy, but I'm not going to go into details in this video, because this is not about hatred or dislike, but about fact. And the facts are there in writing, in books, in the media, and in personal recollections. Many, many people worked for many, many years to polish the Prince of Wales's, now the King, to polish his image. And it had been a hard and grueling task. One Many had been warned off before they accepted the appointment. Thus, based on the facts broadly available in books and the media, it is my firm opinion that we were wrong when we speculated that the king is being blackmailed or all the other things we speculated about. I think... Occam's razor applies to this scenario. The simplest explanation there is, is likely the right one. And for me, I think that the king knows there will be a fight back of sorts from the Sussexes and that the fight back will be through the media. And I think the king knows that everything we are holding against the Sussexes can be said by them about him. And I think that is where the king's fear lies. And I think that is why he is opposing the bull. And I think that is indeed his biggest fear. If not that, then perhaps he does want to be Britain's last king. Because I'm afraid if he does not stand up and speak out this time, that people's opinion will turn against him, that he will be seen as a weak man, that he will be seen as someone who shies away from discipline, as someone who does not want justice, as someone who does not consider his country and his people first. So, my dears, that is my humble opinion. <laughs> anyway, so I sincerely apologize, but videos are going to come at different times, and some will be short and some will be long, because it is going to take a while to repair all the damage in our little town and I will ask my daughter to put some footage on her channel so you can go and have a look at the devastation some people suffered. Thank God we were spared from that. But as I said, power will come on, go off, come on, go off. <laughs> we also did not have phone or internet signal for a good seven, eight hours, but at least that is back now. But I can't promise that it will stay back on. <laughs> anyway, guys, so until we meet again on the next one, whenever that may be, please take good care of yourselves. Bye.